So, lucky to go last year. Um, not going to pull any punches, that's, that's for sure. Um, I just thought I'd start by maybe re-emphasizing what our fleet looks like. Um, it became clear there's some differences, and it kind of plays into what C-SWAP's about. Um, there's 320 vessels in Alaska that fish stable fish. Most of them are, are very small, with very small crews, with very short trips. We bring the fish in fresh. And that's important because we don't have a lot of room on the boat for extra people, extra equipment, so we're really looking at real practical solutions for fishermen that work that are cost effective as well. One of the things Jan mentioned was uh, looking at our uh, communication network, and this is just an example of the device that we're using. It's a satellite texting, uses a radium low-lying satellite device. So fishermen can communicate with people on land with each other, and it's really a like sat phones, the thing about those is you, a lot of them you can't leave a message on. This one you can leave a message on, you don't have to be there. Um, so that's, I think they're less than 200 bucks for those, and then a monthly plan. So our next steps are C-SWAP. Uh, this is a good picture of sort of the uh, um, bigger size vessel that you see in southeast Alaska, and that just kind of gives an example of that. Um, just like to put out the shout outs to all the people we work with. Jan mentioned the Hawaiian uh, uh, longliners, and then the guys in St. Paul. The St. Paul is in the middle of the Bering Sea. There's an island way out there, and they are, they're a very fishery-dependent community. And even though they're in the Bering Sea, they're still a very much a small boat fishery. They're fishing halibut from their skiffs. They have some killer whale issues now and then. Great guys to work with. The fishery management, uh, NOAA, ADF&G, all the academia, great, great people. And again, this is a map showing where the sperm whale depredation occurs, where kind of the crossover is, and generally where the killer whale um, uh, depredation occurs. And you can kind of see the privilege. I just want to talk about those guys just for a second. If you just kind of follow the R over to the right, that's where the privilege are. I mean, they are way, way out there. Oh, yeah. We've got the great laser. So they're kind of way out here. You can't really see them on the chart, but um, they don't have a lot of options out there. So they're very, very fishery dependent people. Okay. And again, just some of the things we see. I, I put this one in here because there's a lot of discussion about what we see and don't see on the hooks. And Jan showed that picture or that video of the first one we got of the sperm whale pulling a fish off the line. And you saw that fish, it put tension on the line, then the fish popped off. Now, there could have been a couple fish that popped off. A couple of them could have swam back down. It might have got one or two. It's very, very hard to quantify whether there was a fish on the hook in the first place. It's a really difficult thing to do, uh, especially with the sperm whales, where you get, you get empty hooks, and you don't know if there was a fish on it or not, um, or whether a whale caused it to pop off or not. Um, where are we going next? So our successes with the decoys, that shows a lot of promise. The avoidance with the uh, communication network is, uh, is, shows a lot of promise as well. Um, in the future, we're going to be looking at a few other things. Uh, the bubbler was this great big contraption that we think we could refine to make more user-friendly. The decoys, refining those as well. And I'll be talking about some of these other devices, the towed array some pods, and acoustic jammers. Um, so the bubblers. Uh, Jan showed you a picture of how those work. The idea is that you have a canister filled with air, and it, as you haul the line up, bubbles come around, it throws off the signal, um, kind of confuses the whale, just can't really penetrate through the, through the bubbles. And it, you, know, you have issues with the current going one way, the line going the other, but we think if we could get something that was workable on a boat, we'd at least understand more about whale behavior, if uh, nothing else. Um, the decoys. Um, this is another good picture to show kind of the smaller range of the boat. Um, this is one of the smallest long liners you kind of see in the sablefish fishery. Um, so the decoys, again, the ones we've been using are very large. Um, 
we think we could be able to make those smaller, lighter, easier to use. They're, they're kind of back-breaking. Like I said, we only have a few people on the crew. But it's also important that you put a, there's a configuration, is that you get some way to record what's going on, both on your long line and on the, on the decoy. Otherwise, you don't really know if it's working, if there was whales around or not, how long they stood around, that kind of thing. Okay, uh, we talked a bit about habituation, and that's a really important thing. We all think about that as we're thinking about our deterrence. Are they going to get used to it? Are we just going to be playing cat and mouse, cops and robbers, our whole lives with these things? And that might be it, but that's kind of an important part of this whole thing to me is thinking about there's not really a one-size-fits-all. There's going to be a lot of tools in the toolbox. Every situation is different. Sometimes there's fishermen around. Sometimes there's not. When there's not fishermen around, for example, we think that the, the decoy could be very, very promising. Even if they become dehabituated to that, they're just going to get confused. You could have multiple vessel sounds thrown out through that decoy, and that's a, that's a yeah, really big piece of that for us. Um, one of the brand new projects we'll be looking at is a towed array, and I was talking to Tim over there from the Falklands, and he was you got kind of excited about that his time in the military probably knows a lot more about it than me um, oh. tow array there it is so the idea is that you tow this behind your vessel with a cable with a couple hydrophones and You'd be able to detect the animals in real time, localized on the fishing ground. Um, this is a shot right from the SpamGuard website. It's an open source software program to feed back into it. And the idea is that you would be able to get range and location of whales before you decide if you want to set your gear there. And the idea of fencing or having a sort of a fence out in front of at least the hot spots that you fish, this could be another tool there if we could do that. We have a concept called geofencing that we use in the North Pacific to try to, sometimes it gets into just areas where people aren't supposed to fish because there's corals or sea lions or those kind of things. And I kind of think of that in that terms as a sort of a geofencing to try to understand if there's whales out there. I mean, you imagine being at home like, no, I'm going to stay at home one more day, play another game of basketball because the whales are out there and the weather's crummy. That'd be nice. In the future, it could very well look like that, some sort of with a satellite tracking. Um, so pods. Um, we've been working on refining a uh, what we call whale pods. And this is a project that got brought to our attention by Derek Marr. He's in uh, Tanzania. And it's a pretty simple device. Um, there's a good picture of it there, but I brought one with me. And some of us use Snap-on still, kind of like the Catalot systems. And the idea behind this is you have some chain in this pod, you gang in here. When a fish bites it, the, it opens up. Some chain hangs around there. And it's probably more of a psychological deterrent. Not sure. It would be interesting to know if there was different acoustic signals from a beads or chain links and those kind of things. Um, the studies they've done, I think they're putting them on every four or five hooks and they're seeing really good results and so far they're continuing to see that. The pelagic longline fishery somewhere around New Zealand, from what I understand, they have three or four different types of cetaceans that depredate. Um, and we're working uh, to see, I think this year we'll have version 3.0, the uh, design maybe both for one for halibut, one for black cod, since the gear is a little bit different. Again, um, the cameras will continue putting those out to get more, uh, uh, try to attempt to get um, depredation uh, behavior, but also learned a lot about what the black cod do or what sablefish do and don't do when there's certain other devices down there, uh, biting behavior, um, when there's grenadiers around, rockfish, that kind of thing. Um, and this is a shout out to our fleet. Um, I can't overemphasize about how important it is to get 
the fishermen on board with the scientists and everybody. We are an uh, independent fleet. We're not corporate in nature. We're not really companies. Um, but we are, there's 320 of us in the North Pacific. There's probably almost 100 of them right out of this area and part of Southeast. Um, and everybody has the same goals, but fishermen are independent by nature. Sometimes they don't want to share information, but what we found, of course, the more information they share, the better off everybody is in the end. And uh, this is the CSWAP website. I don't know, some of you guys have already been on it. And again, a shout out to all the great people we get to work with with doing that. And that's about it.